Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome back to Math 365 PE. It's a pleasure to see you on Friday the 13th. Who's, who's excited for Friday the 13th? Nobody. I'm excited for Math 365. Yeah. Well, I'm trying to, yeah. trying to find a setting here. I want to share my computer audio with you. Well, eventually you'll need to because I want to do another demonstration. Yeah, Bill says, who knows why Friday the 13th is considered unlucky? The student says because of Jason. Is that like a like from the movies? Yeah, the the guy at the bottom of the lake who comes up with the hockey mask. But I feel like it was a thing before the movie. Yeah, it's probably a thing before the Yeah. I don't know. Why is it enlighten us, Ken? Well I I won't I I can't enlighten you, so Bill enlight enlighten us. Oh, Bill was actually asking. Oh. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I assume it's some like pagan ritual or something. Well, okay, so you'll just have to, you tell me if you can um, hear my computer audio, Bill. Well, I can't hear my computer audio, so what's going on? Okay, so like, audio is working. But I can't hear this awesome song I'm trying to play. No. <laughs> Oh well, okay, fine. I'll I'll leave it. You know what song it is, but you can guess what song it was. No. That's a good guess though. What song would be appropriate for this day of the week? Yeah, I thought I'd play the Friday song. Next Friday. Next Friday. Try to get it worked out. I'll bring my speaker. <laughs> yeah, you should. Oh, it's released in nine years. Nine years? Yeah. I thought it was a good one. Nine short years. <laughs> okay. Let's actually do something. <laughs> Wait, we have to have class? Yeah, we have to have class. Um, so I'm going to, as promised, I'm going to tr track through this uh, section in the book. And we're solving heat equations. So I want to solve uh, this equation, this time uh, on a domain D that's going to be the disk of radius. R. So disk of radius capital R. 
And we introduce a special restriction, which is unnecessary to do, but just to simplify these things. And um, so this is a little bit thumbs down from me, but, but I'll keep it. So the idea is that um, we're searching for solutions that are, that have a, a circular symmetry. So you have a, a function u representing the temperature at whatever point and at time t. And this function u only depends on r and t. That is to say, if you pick some r, then the temperature will be the same on that entire circle, radius r. So we're, we're searching explicitly for a, a model in polar coordinates that only depends on the radius and, and, and is independent of theta. And so this tells us, first of all, that the formula for the Laplacian simplifies because the derivatives with respect to theta drop out. And secondly, it tells us that if you look at your initial temperature distribution when time is equal to zero, then this should be a function of the radius only. It is possible to do this without making that assumption. You just have to separate variables twice instead of once. We'll say a little bit more about that as we go. So maybe that could turn into like a project for, for some of you uh, sort of doing this without this, this artificial uh, unnecessary restriction. Um, but, but okay, whatever. So I wanna solve this problem and I wanna have Dirichlet boundary values. So th that is to say on the boundary of that disk, uh, I would like to keep the temperature fixed at, at zero. So necessarily F of capital R is, is equal to zero. Okay, so let's go through and, and solve. And I'll try to speed through the beginning part pretty quickly because this is not, um, this is not unfamiliar. So you search for a product solution of, of the form u equals y times g, where y is a function of r and g is a function of, of time. And you quickly arrive at the equation g prime over k times g is equal to y double prime plus one over r y prime over y equals a negative lambda. And so you can see this is after substituting this product into this equation and dividing through by y times g, and separating the variables to one side of the equation and the, and the other. And then therefore they must both be equal to the same constant, which we're calling negative lambda as usual. Okay. And if we had not assumed the radial part uh, then there would be uh, some more stuff over here, I guess, with G, you know, with, with G prime. There'd be a second derivative in G. Any questions or comments on, on that? And so this leads to two equations as usual. So it leads to uh, G prime equals minus lambda times K times G, which is just the, the straightforward ODE. So this leads to uh, product solution G must be scalar multiple of e to the minus lambda times K times T. Again, that, that's not a surprise to us. Uh, this part of the equation like, stayed the same. It's just the spatial, spart, spatial part that's becoming two dimensional disk. So we've seen this contribution to the product solution uh, before. Uh, on the other hand, this equation, if I write it out, becomes the following eigenvalue equation. Yeah, yeah, 
it's exactly as we've as we've seen before. That's right. That's right. Um, so you can. I have a, like two or three comments about this. So I'll, I'll try to do them one at a time. And if you multiply through by R, multiply through by R, I mean, really you want to multiply through by R squared to get it to, uh, you know, R squared Y double prime, R Y prime, so it kind of matches. But first multiply through by R and get this equation And then you may rewrite it in the following form. So, I mean, I have a couple of comments that are related to how the book presents this material. So this lecture is really um, sort of designed to go with the section in the book and, and presuming that you're looking at this section. So like if you haven't studied that yet, you might, you know, even go back in light of this lecture or or even look back at some of these points after reading. So you can rewrite this equation as follows in this, uh, in this form that is indicative of, of a Sturm Louisville problem, except that it's not quite um, a regular Sturm Louisville problem. It, it looks like it is. Uh, weighted and singular. Which isn't really a problem, but, but it means that we have to it means we're on like a little bit more shaky ground because we, we you know we don't have some theorem about eigenfunctions for singular weighted stern weevil problems. But but that is where we uh, where we are. Um, how, how does the yeah, question? Singular. Um, singular just means that this coefficient is not positive everywhere. Uh, and in fact, it, it's just the when r equals zero that gives you a problem. And so, And so uh, this is what the book Logan calls Bessel's equation. Bessel's equation comes back as, as promised. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, didn't we see a Bessel's equation way back when? And was it the same as this one? So I want to connect some dots there. So if you look at that lecture we did, the lecture we did, by the way, was, was finding product solutions to UTT equals C Laplace and U. And we did it with, with no assumption of the circular symmetry, so including variable theta. And the equation for the spatial part that we arrived at uh, was this. I went back and checked to make sure I'm not fibbing. And this is what Borthwick called uh, Bessel's equation. And So are both authors right? Uh, basically, yes. Um, Borthwick is a little more right. Uh, so Bessel's equation is quite general. And this, this one is a, a specific form of Bessel's, a form, uh, Bessel's equation with, with that k equal to 0. So forgive me momentarily. Um, this k is, is not the diffusion constant. So this k is, is not that one, right? So that, that k is not part of this presentation. This was back from, from Borthwick. 
What was this cave? When you do this, or even when you do our heat diffusion, but without assuming circular symmetry, you have to separate variables twice. So once, like we did, but yet another time to separate out theta and r from each other. And lambda was our first separation constant. And k was the second separation constant that came from separating out theta. You can go back and, and, and check that. Um, one of the reasons I'm doing this presentation is so that, that in retrospect, you may go back and look at some things we've done before, and I think it'll make more sense to you. And so if you make the assumption that the, the solution doesn't depend on theta, then you won't need the extra se separation constant as we've just seen. And in fact, uh, this will be zero. Which will then just give you, you know, like r squared y double prime plus r y prime equals minus lambda r squared. And of course, if you divide by r, then it becomes this equation, which you can rewrite like that. And it's not wrong to divide by something that's always positive. I guess I'm, I'm like, I'm a little, like you, you can be zero at the origin. Yeah. So I'm, I'm a little, I, I guess I should know this. Like it, it probably doesn't change the, the solution of the equation to, to uh, multiply by, by a non-zero, non-negative function on both sides. But you couldn't do this trick of like multiplying or dividing by R if you had, if you had non-zero K. Like, but it does, it does work. Um, I mean, you could do it. It just wouldn't give you that equation. That's what I'm saying. So that's the relationship. You have to take this and multiply by r squared to get back to their Bessel equation with, with k equals zero. And Borthwick's Bessel equation is the Bessel, Bessel equation. So that's what's being said. So you don't want to trick yourself like, uh, yeah, this is a Bessel equation, but um, you're multiplying by r to make that work and setting one of the parameters equal to zero. And I'll say maybe a little bit more about that later, but for now, I'll, I'll let it go. And let's just focus on let's just focus on this equation. And so, like as usual, you want to exclude the case that lambda is less than zero. And this is actually problem one in the textbook for exercises. So. Maybe we can just make that homework. But you can use an energy argument. You don't have to, you know, do something nuanced and elaborate. Uh, lambda equals zero, we've seen a few times before. The independent solutions are one. And natural log of r, just as before. Uh, and of course, since we're looking for solutions that are defined upon the entire disk, which includes r equals zero, we, we exclude the singular solution and put uh, y, y equals one as our independent solution for, for lambda equals zero. And now lambda bigger than zero. So here it comes. As we've mentioned, this is Bessel's, well, multiplying this by r is Bessel's equation with k equals zero. And the solution to that is the Bessel function of the zeroth kind. Well, Bessel function of the first kind with k equals zero.
So these, so this, the solution, so remember there were two solutions to the Bessel equation presented by Borthwick, depending on parameter k. So you change k and it gives you different solutions. And uh, this one blew up at the origin, so we didn't talk about it, S similar to excluding natural log of r. In fact, I guess you can show that the asymptotic behavior of this as r goes to zero is like um, proportional to natural log of r. Yeah. So this is not the diffusion constant, it's the decay from Borthwick's presentation. Yep. And if you take k equals zero, then your, then your solution is uh, j zero of r. And, oh, yeah, question. And so the typical way that you solve this in ODE class is what we call by doing a series Solution, so you, you assume that y of r is like some, I mean, it's kind of like, like Fourier series something, right? Like you assume a form like this and plug it into the equation and then try to derive a rec like a recursive formula or an inductive formula for the coefficients and solve those equations. So that can be done. And in fact, the last time I presented this, I showed you the, the formula for the, the power series. And so this time, I'll show you a different formula that's due to Bessel himself. So there's an integral form. And it's cosine of x times sine of t dt. So even though it's not obvious, at all, actually, I'm, I'm even fibbing a little bit. So let me just explain what's going on. So the solution to that equation is root lambda. So do it like this. This is J naught of R and Y is J naught of root lambda times R. So officially you need to take lambda equals one to have it be called the Bessel equation, but it doesn't matter because you can change coordinates. So if you multiplied this by, uh, by R squared instead of R, so that you had lambda times r squared times y on the right hand side. So you saw me do this before. So you define something like s equals um, root lambda times r. So that this becomes s squared, you do that change of variable. And this just becomes like s squared times y and then solve it, uh, getting this formula, but with S, then switch it back to R, and you get, you get that. I believe we did that um, the last time I presented it, but, but uh, right, you should be taking lambda equals one um, officially for this to be, um, called the Bessel equation, and in the other parts, uh, it has this scale invariant property. So changing the scaling doesn't change the other part of the equation, so long as you had multiplied by r squared, which is another advertisement for why the actual Bessel equation is really r squared plus r equals negative lambda r squared. Question? Oh, sorry.
Okay. So um, join me, please, on Zoom, and let's look at some graphs. What? <laughs> Just a minute for everyone to get onto the call. Okay, thank you. Okay, everybody, um, look at this graph. <laughs> oh, wait, wait, I think I, I should have had the other screen up. Um, Wait a minute, I shared the wrong screen. Oh, no. Oh, no. Look at this graph, okay. <laughs> Look at this graph. So um, uh, you get a different Bessel function for each k. The general formula is one over two pi, integral negative pi to pi cosine uh, uh, kt minus x sine t. Sine t. So for, uh, for k equals zero, and noting that cosine is an even function, the formula I wrote is is certainly correct. So I've got a little slider for k you can see. And therefore, this is the Bessel function of the, of the first kind with k equals 0. So that's what it looks like. <coughs> Excuse me. You can see this nice periodic function. Does most taken a while to, to draw it. And I can even show you other values of k, like k equals 1, k equals 2. Equals three. So these functions are, an orthogonal system. You, you can see them start to flatten out near the origin, which is actually kind of like what you want if you're doing a series expansion because the, like the part of your function between negative two and two is like handled by the first 5k, and then you know, so on and so forth. But we're gonna stick with k equals zero, and it'll be our different eigenvalues that give us the expansion. So I don't want you to get the wrong idea about that. I'll go back and share with you um, something else that's more substantive in a minute, uh, but for the moment, let's move on. So here we, we go. Um, we have an initial condition that can help us find lambda. And that initial condition is that, is that um, this function, when I plug in capital R, should be should be zero, right? Because when I take my product solution and plug in r and t, I'll get y r g of t, and y of r is this function, and it's equal to to that. So uh, it's actually the places um, that make this Bessel function zero that I'm interested in. So it's, it's the zeros of the Bessel function. So if I write um, 
Zn for the nth zero. And by the way, there is a whole list of them, like Z1, Z2. Uh, then I'm going to have Zn has to be root lambda times times r. And so uh, lambda is therefore going to be Zn squared over capital R squared. And if you go back to the, if you go back to the, to the graph there. Remember, we're in the case where lambda is equal positive, so we should be in the positive part of the graph. You can see these zeros. And I've written them down. The first one comes around 2.48. Actually, it looks like more like 2.41, but I'm not going to change it. The next one comes around 5.52. Got that one right. The next one comes around 8.65. And I'll be working with those to get an approximate solution in a, in a moment. So that. It's an infinite number of zeros, right? Yeah, it's an infinite number, and be, because it's, it, you, you'll keep seeing these oscillations forever and ever. And so this gives us a formula for, for lambda. And therefore, you're really looking at, at this solution. So Z n over capital R. So this is your independent solution for that eigenvalue. And so now they really are indexed by n with y0 just being, just being 1. So you then look at your typical product solution. And I guess when you take lambda equals zero in this expression, you'll get something that's not zero. You get something that's not zero. In fact, you get, yeah, you get one. Uh, I don't know if it's necessary, but I'll, I'll share it so you can see. So, so when you plug in zero, you get one. So you can actually amalgamate all these together and just use the, uh, just use the Bessel functions starting at n equals zero. So gn uh, lambda n is now going to be e to the minus zn squared over capital R squared times diffusion constant times t, or sorry, gn yn, and times jn zn over capital R. times r. So this is your nth product solution. And this holds good for n goes from 0 to 1 to 2, so on and so forth. Yeah, that's right. And so you get a solution now, u r t. to be n going from 0 to infinity. Or, sorry, this was j0. It's always the 0th um, Bessel function. That, that isn't changing, but, it, but zn changes. Well, we, I really want to say that k is the diffusion constant, but, but the, the number we were calling k in the other example is, stays zero. The thing that's changing are, are the zeros of the, of the Bessel function. And you'll remember back in the other demonstration, we had a doubly indexed uh, sequence. You know, for each jk, we had infinite number of zeros associated to that k. 
So here's our, our thing. And remember, this was a weighted Sturm-Louisville problem. So the orthogonality relation is going to be with respect to this weighted inner product. So if I take yn and ym with respect to weighted inner product, that is to say, uh, integral from 0 to capital R, j0, zn over capital R, j0, zn over capital R times R, dr, then this will be 0. So that's something we, we do know. So uh, these will be a complete ortho orthogonal system with respect to weighted inner product, not with respect to usual integration. So this is the thing that's true, and it lets us calculate the coefficients with linear algebra. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. And this expression also needs coefficients. Infinite linear combination of the product solutions. Excuse me. And so if you want to figure these out with, with linear algebra, you get something like, like what? Well, you, you know that that f of r is equal to u of r zero. And when t equals zero, so this factor is, is equal to to one, yeah, and so <laughs> another mistake be kind of kind of bugging me. This is this, I should I should exclude um, gamma equals zero. I should exclude gamma equals zero or, or gamma equals zero because. Because if I take y equals 1, this does not satisfy the boundary condition that y of capital R equals 0. I just didn't do that earlier. Right? I excluded the other natural log of r because r equals 0 needs to be bounded. But on the boundary, you're supposed to be 0, which this does not satisfy. So it's, it's out. So these go from n equals 1, n equals 1. Have to satisfy the boundary condition. That's the point of finding the zeros of this function. So we're looking at the Dirichlet problem. OK, so apologize for that. And so what you're going to do is take f inner product with y sub n, you know, j0 z n over r times, times r. And then everything will drop out except for coefficient c n. And then you'll have this on the other side. So you get the usual formula that this is now integral from 0 to capital R of f times j0 zn over capital R times little r times r dr divided by, I mean, I guess I'll write it out.
divided by that. And so that's your formula for your coefficient. And so in some sense, the problem is solved because this is a formula. And that's an expression for the coefficients. But, but as usual, that feels like a little bit unsatisfying. So this is nice. I've got a little bit um, time left. So I'll, I'll do a book problem. And the problem that I'll do says, take capital R equals 1, take the diffusion constant equal to 1 fourth, and take the initial function to be 5 r cubed times 1 minus r. Did I write that down for you? So I'll, I'll do this book problem. And it says, please take a three-term approximation and graph it and give us time slices. So we've seen example of this before. Um, so I'll do one here. And I think after we move online in a week, I'll probably ask all of you to, to do something like that too and like maybe do a presentation to the class. Like that would be like a cool thing to do online. So let's... do it in just a moment. Before I have to, before I do, I have to correct one other thing. So many mistakes in it. But my, well, it's not on the board, but the definition of J0, J0, it, it includes a factor of 1 over 2 pi. And I did that in my calculation, but I didn't write it on the board, perhaps. Oh, I did? Oh, okay, good. I was, um... Oh, I see, yeah, yeah, I, right, okay, fine. Right. Is it, so J0 is 1 over 2 pi? From, right, right, yeah, yeah. Did I put that factor in there? Okay, good. I'm just, gosh, I'm just having a tough day today. Oh, All right, so it's Friday the 13th. Well, so let me show you this thing. So the, like if you want to calculate this, so the first thing I did was I actually typed in my expression for Cn, which, which you can see here. Unfortunately, I couldn't put it as the sum or the slider because there's no uniform expression for these zeros. And I had 2.48, but I guess it's closer to 2.41. So it's my first zero, so I'll kind of correct that. And you can see me, what, what fun, I called function g to be j naught. Desmos doesn't accept j naught. Uh, it gets upset over indexes, but so I called it g of x. And I've got my slider k set to zero, so this is, this is truly j naught. And then I have to take um, g of, of root lambda, which in this case really is the zero because capital R is set to one. And I have to take f of r equals five times r cubed times one minus r. So that really is the right thing. And I get um, 4.71. Uh, for the next one, 5.52, I get minus 0.75. For the next one, 8.65, I get 3.8. And I need to just write down the three-term approximation now, which I'll just change that 2.48 to 2.41. So I have to put in the coefficient. And since I made the change, it becomes 
one and with significant figure that's like 0 0.472. Well, 0 0.47165, so 0 0.4717, perhaps, times e to the minus one-fourth times 2.41 squared times s, using the parameter s instead of t, because t has already been used, and all variables in Desmos are global, uh, times... Yeah, times g of 2.41. And do I need another variable? So I do I need like an like an x there? Yeah, 2.41 times x. And my next one was point, negative 0.754 e to the minus 1 fourth, 5.52 squared s times g of 5.52 times x. And then the next one's 0 0.3083 e to the minus 0 0.25, 8.65 s, g of 8.65 x. And so I'm doing this from zero to one because that's my range of, of r. So here now I'll take away the vessel function. Let, let's check our initial condition. Here's the initial condition, which we're really interested in it from, from zero to one. That's, yeah, that was stated to us. This goes from zero to one, but you understand that this is the, the radial temperature on the disk. So at radius one half, all the temperatures are equal to, you know, 0 0.3125. So that, that's what you should interpret that as. So now when S equals zero, let's see how close we are to the initial condition. So, I mean, it's not too bad, but it's, it's a three-term approximation, so it is off, you know. And so you, you can't expect the solution to be any better than, than that as you progress forward in time. So just bear that in mind. But you can see this approximate solution. And now we can take a movie. So I, I take S going from 0 to 5 with the step size of... 0.01 and a speed of 0.01x. So we're undo. Okay. Um, <laughs> yikes. So um, we're slowing down time by by a hundredth, but uh, it's not clear what the actual physical units are here. So just did this to get a reasonable movie. So let's play the movie. Getting flatter. Um, well, this is like that's kind of like a, a like a like a hat or like a bubble near zero that's slowly fading down to the to the origin, right? Right. So you have to imagine rotating this around the, you know, around the if this were the z-axis, you're yeah, rotating it around, sort of creating, creating an x-axis as you, if this were like the z-y plane. So what's happening with this model? Is the, the boundary being held at zero? Yes. Okay. Yep. This is the Dirichlet problem for the heat equation uh, on a disk. And these temperature profiles that you're seeing are, as the radius goes from zero to one, the circle of that radius has the temperature given by the y value, the green line. 
That's right. So this is like a presentation that uh, I'd like to see y'all show us somehow with maybe a different problem, like after we're fully online. And so some challenges, like I, I challenge you to work this out without assuming that symmetry, like it, with including the variable theta. Uh, you can do it, it'll just be a series with a double index and one more product function. And it's 12.05, so we'll, we'll stop there. So thank you, everybody, for your time and attention. Have a wonderful day and a great weekend. See you.